Welcome back to Teach Me About the Great Lakes, a podcast in which I get people who are smarter than I am to teach me about the Great Lakes. My name is Stuart Carlton. I'm Assistant Director at Illinois Indiana Sea Grant, and with me, as always, is Communications Coordinator Hope Charters. Hope! Woohoo! Hey, Stuart. <laughs> How are you today? I am doing fantastic, and I'm super excited to hear from our interviewee today. Yeah, I'm really excited, too, because what we have uh, this week is some uh, a woman. Her name is, uh, her name is uh, Laureen Neuenheis, and she decided to walk around Lake Michigan. And I don't mean walk around near Lake Michigan. I don't mean walk around in a circle in front of Lake Michigan. I don't mean walk around in Lake Michigan. I mean literally walk <laughs> around Lake Michigan. And she did this on purpose. And she has some really interesting things to say about the poetry of hiking around a lake. And so I'm uh, very excited for this interview. I, too, actually thought about hiking um, uh, a long way. When I was younger, my good friend Paul Edmonds, um, who is not listening to this, but if you are, hello, Paul, <laughs> uh, and I, we decided that we were going to hike the Appalachian Trail while singing the song Lengthwise by Fish for the entire time, excepting, of course, sleeping. Um, and there were some details that maybe we hadn't worked out yet, uh, but we thought that would be really good. It's a, it's a two line song. It's a, it's own particular bit of genius, which is uh, when you're there, I sleep lengthwise. And when you're gone, I sleep diagonal in my bed, which is uh, true. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we thought we'd sing that, uh, for however long it takes to through hike the Appalachian trail. And there were several problems with that. Number one being, um, that that would be annoying. And number two being the part about through hiking the Appalachian trail. So we were kind of over two on that one. Yeah. That but... kind of reminds me of, uh, it's a small world after all, just playing over and over again at Disney world and it drives you yes. crazy. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's like that, but I am much less profitable than Disney world. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So what about you? You have any sort of unusual, uh, have you gone on like a majorly long hike or, uh, maybe been like, uh, um, I enjoy, you know, the hour to three hour hikes here and there. When I was in Ecuador one time, um, we went down to Lake Kilatoa, which is actually in a volcanic crater. So about 600 years ago, I think the volcano erupted, left a crater in the earth and then it became a lake at the bottom. And so we hiked all the way down, which was very steep. And then I didn't think about it when we were going down, but obviously you have to get back up. So I think I made it about halfway up and then I caught a mule and, you know, rented a mule for the, for the last half because I'm uh, weak. That's really good. My, uh, my, my daughter, uh, when she was just about two years old, we were leaving Gainesville, Florida, where I got my PhD. And there's a state park there. Uh, what's it called? Devil's Mill Hopper. And it has several hundred stairs down into like this – uh, I don't know, gulch or gully or whatever it is. Um, and she had, was pretty good at walking at that point and walked down every single stair. And we got to the bottom and she looked up and she looked at me <laughs> and I looked at and her. And it was a piggyback ride from there on. <laughs> and we walked up several hundred stairs, <laughs> me carrying her. And uh, that is the extent of my stamina, um, is, is that. And even then, it was spurred on by lots of whining and complaining. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, we're excited to get to the interview. But before we do, a little bit of housekeeping. The things that I always forget. Number one, uh, don't forget to like or subscribe, uh, review the show. So if you're in the Apple thing, click on the review thing and give us five stars or or four stars. Uh, if you're in another podcast thing, uh, do the same and write us some reviews, subscribe, uh, because that's really important in helping us to grow the show. There's been a great response to our first couple of episodes, which I've definitely gotten because we're not recording this before we've released the second episode. <laughs> and, um, but there has been a really good response and we want as many people as possible to learn as much as possible about the Great Lakes. So please make sure you take those steps. Um, and if you have any feedback, uh, go ahead and find us on Twitter at, uh, what is it? Teach Great Lakes. If you have any questions, any feedback, maybe you have a question about the Great Lake, the Great Lakes that you would like to have answered. We can find some expert to answer it because everybody who's anybody wants to appear on the show and everybody who's anybody wants to have a question answered. And maybe that includes you. Uh, so reach out to us on social media that way. And with that, let's go ahead and bring on, uh, Laureen Neuenheis and hear what she has to say. And 
so our guest today is uh, Laureen Neuenhuis, and she is I, – I don't even know how to explain what she is. I mean she's an author. She's an adventurer. She's a speaker. Uh, but the, the things she writes about are somewhat unusual and fits in with our theme of unusual persistence. Laureen has walked around Lake Michigan. And uh, if that's not enough, she's also walked a thousand miles around other Great Lakes and then a thousand miles um, around islands. Is that right? The island adventure was hiking, biking, and boating. So it was it was a little different from was, the first two, which were just 1,000-mile hikes. It's like a nice, uh, maybe a little more relaxed version of a triathlon, except for the 1,000-mile part. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's actually, I, uh, let me plug the book. The most recent book is A Thousand Mile Great Lakes Island Adventure. And you can find more about uh, her books and her adventures uh, at www.laketrek.com. Trek spelled like an adventure or like Star Trek. Um, all right, Laureen, I think the first question that uh, people have, and I'm sure you've gotten a lot, is uh, it really is just a one word question. And that question is why? <laughs> yeah, I do get that one a lot. Uh, I, I reached a point in my life where I had a bit of a midlife crisis and I needed to take on a very big challenge, something so large I wasn't even sure I could finish it. And I looked to my favorite place, which has always been Lake Michigan, and I decided to get to know it step by step and record it in my muscles and bones by walking all the way around it. So I got to know my favorite place intimately like that. And, and so how does one start to walk around Lake Michigan? Well, I had never done a thousand mile hike before. Let me just say that. <laughs> so it sounded a little insane to, to even talk about it. So I decided to break it up into 10 segments and to spread it out over seven months. That allowed me to just focus on the first five days and just getting through that chunk of it. And I also wanted to see the lake in all four seasons. So I began at the end of winter and I ended in the beginning of fall. So I saw the many moods of Lake Michigan. So the many moods of Lake Michigan, how would you describe those moods exactly? Is it angry at times? Is it calm? Yeah, it runs the whole gamut. Uh, there was one storm that blew in and it dropped five inches of snow inland and it turned the lake into just this raging monster. There were five foot tall, curling, crashing waves. And the, the winds were still still sustained at about 40 miles an hour. And it was so loud that I, I had my son. I told both my sons, I get three days of your spring break. You're hiking with me. <laughs> so my, my youngest son, Lucas, was with me. And it was so loud between the wind and the waves that even if we were standing shoulder to shoulder, we couldn't hear each other talk, even if we were yelling. So we had to resort to hand signals, you know, like, stop, I need a drink of water. Or he kept giving me the signal like, mom, you're crazy. Why are we out here? <laughs> yeah, I think my kids would give me a certain hand signal if I asked them to do yeah. that as well. So you had your sons with you for three days each, right? And yes. who, who was with yeah. you the rest of the time? Was it just random companions or... Uh, about 80% was a solo hike, and that's how it was uh, conceived when I first thought about doing it. But then people started uh, emailing me, like, you're going to walk by my house, or you're walking through my town, I want to walk with you. So I did coordinate with complete strangers to walk with them for a few hours, just to hear their stories of the lake. Uh, and people like my sister and my cousin insisted on walking with me. Um, so that was lovely that people wanted to be part of this adventure and to and to partake in it a little bit. That was lovely. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Who doesn't want to be a part of a cool experience like that? Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so how did people find you? This was so this uh this was a bit ago, but not super long ago. Was this a social media thing? Was it Facebook or Social media, and I, I started getting uh, a lot of media coverage just as I would walk around the lake. Reporters would come out and, and interview me, and some would even walk with me a little bit. So people started hearing about my adventure and yeah. join, and wanted to join me. Yeah. And so, uh, and so you were uh, doing social media, tweeting your walk or Facebooking your walk. Um, was it, did you have like GPSs too, or how did you find your way around Lake Michigan or on these other treks? Couldn't she just follow the water? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Go to the water and turn left. Yeah. yeah. Well, Lake Michigan was pretty easy, especially the west side of the lower peninsula of Michigan, because it's almost 95% sandy beach. At least it was back then. The lake level was much lower. So as long as the lake was on my left side, I was good. 
<laughs> but I did have a GPS with me to measure my miles each day. And also in case I had to navigate around things like a power plant or a water intake or a sewage treatment plant. Uh, and there are even some uh, like limestone mines along some of the lakes. So these were things that were very easy to see on satellite images. So I would make note of where they were. And then, you know, I'd have to safely navigate around them and then get back to the shoreline. So did you take like a paper map with you too, just in case you lost GPS signal or something? I don't know how GPS works. Uh, GPS, you wouldn't lose the signal unless there were really thick, low clouds and it bounced it around. Otherwise, it's like a satellite phone in that it always connects to satellites. So uh, I didn't take, well, occasionally I would take a paper map if there were a couple structures I wanted you know, to know the roads around them to, in order to navigate around them. But most of the time I just relied on my GPS. So mile one is exciting. Mile two is exciting. Mile three is is exciting. Mile seven or eight is kind of maybe exciting, but you're starting to get tired. But what about like four days into it or three days into it, where this really starts to seem like a you know a, a bear, right? Uh, where the enormity uh, comes to you. Did, <laughs> were you ever almost like overwhelmed by your task? At times, especially early on on the first hike, I was because it's very difficult to train for that sort of, you know, I'm, I'm on sand dunes one day, then I'm on a sidewalk, then I'm on rocks. Uh, so there was a bit of just overall fatigue and soreness for that first hike. Uh, yeah, but as I got into the hike, you know, around 400 miles in, <laughs> right. there, was, there was a very strange thing that happened uh, once I was attuned to walking along the lakeshore, I got the sense that the world was turning beneath me. Like it was almost effortless. And I could just really connect with the water and with nature and just with the flow of the hike. And and that was really a gift from this this first adventure. It almost becomes medita meditative after a while. Definitely. That's exactly Definitely. what just came to my mind too. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. And so in that way... Maybe it's a benefit that you didn't have other people with you because you can really feel the world under your feet. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. My cousin especially is very chatty. So when she was with me, I'm like, let's just listen for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I'm reminded of um, there's another author named Bill Bryson who wrote a book on hiking the Appalachian oh, Trail. Uh, I love him. Yeah. yeah. And a wonderful, wonderful book. But but after a while, the relationship between the two hikers um, got a little bit strained, I think. And since it's Bill Bryson, it was comedic to read about it being strained. But, yes. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. So maybe maybe there's something to – uh, the being alone, but still, I would think there's got to be some loneliness that kicks in, no? You know, I, I was reading so much about the lakes. So while I was hiking, I was able to think about all that information and to connect it with what I was seeing. And uh, I enjoyed having those long connected thoughts. We don't have that empty space in our lives as much. So, you know, we have computers and phones ringing and we have to run here and there. So to have those unbroken chunks of time moving with the lake and to connect all the information that I had read and I was seeing, it was it was wonderful to be able to uh, consolidate it that way. What all did you take with you? Because like I have a hard enough time packing for trips where I get to take a bag of luggage. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so how do you decide what to take and what are the essentials and then yeah. what kind of emergency things did you take? Well, when you're carrying everything on your back, you can be much more critical <laughs> about what about what you're carrying. <laughs> People always ask me, did you pick up rocks? And I was like, sometimes I had 40 pounds in my back, so it had to be the perfect rock. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, I just really had the basics uh, in my backpack. I would always have rain gear. I would always have chocolate because I get a little grumpy without chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if I If I was on a segment where I was going to do some camping, that I would have all my camping gear. Uh, but I really kept it all to a bare minimum. And for the most of the part around uh, Lake Michigan, there are little there were little places to resupply. So I didn't have to carry 10 days of food or five days of food. You know, I could carry two days of food and resupply as I walked through a small town. So that made it that made it a little uh, easier. Yeah, that's nice. And how many days did you say it took you to get all the way around? Lake Michigan was 64 days. I averaged 16 miles a day on that hike. What kind of shoes did you wear? That's my number one question. I told Sarah before we talked to you, I was like, I just want to know what kind of shoes yeah. she was wearing. 
I always wear Keens. I love Keens. They have a really good uh, toe box, so a your toe, toe don't box. bite, yeah. you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, you don't have to break them in. Uh, they're generally soft enough that you can just just get out there after a day or so and and do a very long hike. So yeah. <laughs> And did you find yourself interacting with strangers a lot on the hike or, or uh, like, do people ask you about this um, outside of the social media context? Sure. Yeah. I would greet people along the way and have conversations. One guy in Wisconsin, as I was making my way south to Chicago, he looked at my backpack. He goes, what are you doing? Walking to Chicago? I said, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best answer to that question. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it reminds me of the old Mad Magazine snappy answers to stupid questions. Um, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, geez. So, so here's a question. So you've walked around, and this is just like Michigan, and and you've also done 2,000 other miles of traveling that you've talked about, right? And so a real chance to see the lakes through the seasons, a real chance to see the lakes, uh, you know, uh, over time and through geography. What if what what does that teach you on that sort of micro small scale that might not be obvious when you like fly over the lakes or when you ride by in a car or something like that? I think the biggest thing I learned, and I learned this on the first hike just around Lake Michigan, but it holds true uh, for all the good lakes, is that geology determines access. So like the west side of Michigan's lower peninsula, almost all sandy beach. So people in Michigan connect with the beaches of Lake Michigan. They connect to that access. They throw themselves in the lake. But if you go up to Wisconsin... There's very little access like that. There are large earthen hills that are constantly sloughing off into the lake. So there's a lot of debris in the lake. There's very little sandy beach along Wisconsin. So people in Wisconsin, even though they're living on the shores of the same Great Lake, have a very different relationship to it. They go inland for recreation and they don't really think about Lake Michigan. And that was shocking to me because Lake Michigan is such a like a daily part, especially of people who live along the lake shore. It's there. It's 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 chain it changes the you can see the weather coming. Uh it picks up all this moisture and you know you'll get a lot of snow on the western side of Michigan, whereas you know Wisconsin will be colder, but they won't get the snow. It all comes over to Michigan. Uh, so that access determines how people think about and connect to the lakes. Lake Erie has a lot of marsh along the edges. Again, there's very little sandy beach. So it's a boater's lake. There are more fish in Lake Erie than in the other lakes. So boaters have a very different connection to that body of water than people who are swimming and sailing and uh, connecting with it in a different way. That's fascinating. Before I came here, I was uh, at Texas Sea Grant, and we used to always talk about how Texas... Uh, is a coastal state, but the people don't think of it as a state with a coast. Um, oh. Part of that is because of the sheer size of Texas. You can drive a right. day in any direction, uh, yeah. you know, and not <laughs> and not get to the end of it. Uh, much less hike. You could probably hike for I don't even want to know um, across yeah. Texas. And and then when you get to the coast and much of the area, it's nice, but it's very. Uh, um, it's very petrochemical, shall we right. say. And, right. and, uh, yeah. but, but compare that to just across the Gulf when you get into the panhandle of Florida or something like that. And it's like these, these states have a really strong coastal identity and these are coastal states. And, and so I think what you're saying there, geology determines access. And in some ways, geology determines identity when it comes to a lake identity. Yes. That's, that's yes. A, a fascinating way of thinking about it. And so in your mind, you see this as a wonderful place to recreate, and you see it as some of the lakes are fishers' lakes, right? Uh, what, what, what makes it, the Great Lakes unique? What have you learned beyond that that makes some kind of unique or valuable resource that in your mind makes it worth uh, conserving or worth fighting for? Uh, you know, these lakes are so large, and people who have never seen them really don't have a, a sense of how large they are. But technically, they're classified as inland seas. They contain 84% of the fresh surface water in all of North America. So if you gathered up all the rivers and streams and lakes outside the Great Lakes, you'd only have 16%. So it just 
to, to conceptualize the vastness of these lakes uh, and how much fresh water they contain is very important. When you consider that 40 million people get their drinking water from the lakes, and when you consider the amount of, of economic prosperity that's here because of people coming to enjoy these lakes, uh, that gives you some sense and some building blocks of why we need to cherish and protect these lakes. And one thing about Lake Michigan as I hiked around it, I realized that even though it took me 64 days to walk around it, it's vast, but it's fragile. We've messed up Lake Michigan. We've thrown the balance out many times. Invasive species, pollution, uh, uh, the um, the lamprey taking out the fish, and then we threw salmon in there to kind of bring balance back and, and to eat up all the alewives. We're talking about a lake that took me two months to walk around, and yet we can mess it up. So I, I do think we need to be guardians and protectors of these lakes and to, and to realize the, the vast natural resource that we have here. Yeah, that's interesting. Earth time, geologic time is slow, right? And, and human time is fast. Yeah. And yeah. The, the leverage we have uh, and the ability to make environmental change so quickly, I think it's hard to conceive of. And I think some yeah. people can't conceive of that, uh, which ties into uh, some of the other issues related to climate change, denial and, and what have you. But, but, yeah. but I mean, you know, we're billions of years in the making here. And even though the Great Lakes themselves, I just learned this last episode, which everybody else did, I assume at, uh, uh, but you know, the Great Lakes themselves may be only about uh, a couple thousand years old or 10,000 years old, excuse ten. me. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yes, ten. <laughs> but yep, no, my uh, computer blinked at me and I got distracted. And so oh, okay. the Great Lakes, yeah. <laughs> let's try that again. And yeah. so the Great Lakes themselves may only be 10,000 years old, but that's still you know, as old as agriculture, right? And and you look yeah. at the, the speed of the change in the last century or two or yes. three, and uh, it's, it's, it's mind boggling. Yes. What do you do in Lake Michigan besides um, take crazy amounts of time to hike around it? <laughs> do you boat? Do you swim? Do you paddleboard? I do kayak. I do swim. Uh, but hiking and rock collecting and just just hiking. I, I just love walking on the shoreline. Yeah. Did you do anything to prep for this hike? Like, did you go on super long hikes? You know, kind of how you train for a marathon if you're going to run a marathon. Did for you the do very, anything to prep? For the very first hike I did, I did work out. I, I'm not really, I don't really like going to the gym, but I did do a bit of that and I did run a little bit. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, it's difficult to train for just the changing terrain uh, that, mm -hmm. so that was a little rough on my body until I, you know, like I said, got 400 miles into it, then it was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The first 400 miles is always the hardest. That's what I always, thinking. right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 401 is a sweet, sweet mile. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so if I want to, I'm not going to hike a thousand miles. Um, I'll be honest. I'm not going to hike 22 miles. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not going to hike 401, but, but if I wanted to like, where are some really beautiful areas, having walked around Lake Michigan, that you can recommend if people are interested in in seeing just some stunning hikes? Are there one or two that stick out? Yeah, definitely. I actually put out uh, an ebook on Amazon called Best Lake Michigan Hikes because people kept asking me, where do I go? And and also to get to the lakeshore safely and then to know where you're going to get off the lakeshore safely. And Actually, if you look at that, the, the 10 hikes there, some of them may not be accessible now because Lake Michigan's level is so high. So you really need to assess the conditions when you get to the lakeshore and how safe it is. But one area that has about 100 miles of hiking trails, many of them very close or on the lakeshore, is Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore, just west of Traverse City. And two of my favorite hikes up here, because I, I live in this region or I live in Traverse City. Um, two of my favorite hikes up here are the Empire Bluff Trail and Pyramid Point. And we got some crazy okay music there. there. <laughs> I clicked, sorry, I couldn't tell if you guys could hear it or not. Oh, no, we yeah, could hear like, it. Yeah. I was really trying to figure out which tab it was coming from. <laughs> I'm so sorry. You're going to have to start that no, over. No, no, we'll keep that in. Um, and uh, <laughs> what we'll also do, though, um, what we'll also do is we'll put a link to your book in our show notes, which people can find at uh, teachgreatlakes.transistor.fm. Uh, slash three, because this is a episode number three. And uh, we'll put a link to your book 
notes there. And so those are actually pretty close for people who are listening in the Chicago area or for people who are listening near us in West Lafayette. Uh, that's a relatively easy drive to get to, to those hikes. So uh, maybe I'll get the kids in the car and we'll do that over the, the break. Um, oh, uh, never mind. I'm not supposed to speak like we're recording this uh, in December. Um, I had a lot of fun doing that over the break with my kids. Uh, <laughs> it's like time travel. Right. It's like I said, this is a totally, uh, totally evergreen recording. All right. Um, maybe we should just take the entire Illinois Indiana Sea Grant staff. Yeah, maybe we that should. Sounds great. We'll have Chelsea host us. Yeah. So what's next for you? You've done 3,000 mile journeys across the Great Lakes. Uh, so is the move then for another thousand mile journeys or uh, journey, or have you kind of exhausted that or looking for a different adventure? Well, on my island adventure, exploring the islands of the Great Lakes, I got up to Isle Royal and I volunteered for the wolf moose study. They need volunteers to hike the island and gather moose bones, which sounds odd, but it's the most fun ever. <laughs> How, like what kind of moose bones are like leg bones or... Well, you sometimes you find the whole skeleton. Sometimes you just find one bone. And you're like, where the rest of them go? Oh my goodness! But, <laughs> How big is a moose bone? Can you carry it? Are you supposed to well, carry it? What, what's the we, deal? We have we have to bring back the skulls and then a metatarsal, which is a rear leg bone. Yeah. For How, the scientist. How big is the skull? Uh. Like, imagine that I have no idea how big a moose is. Right. Because I don't. <laughs> well, have, have you seen, like, out west they have the cow skulls? Yeah. It's about as big as a cow skull, but sometimes they have the antlers attached, and the antlers can weigh 20 pounds. Oh, my goodness. Oh, wow. <laughs> so you're hooking a moose head across yeah. Isle Royal for science. Yes. <laughs> and it's the most fun. I've, it's so much fun that I did it one time for the book and I've returned another four times. And last or just this year, well, if we don't want to deal with time. No, no, we're good. Yeah. I, e <laughs> I, I even led a team uh, of hikers this, this past excursion. Um, so that's something I plan to do as long as I can do it because it is so much fun. Oh my uh, but I do feel the pull of a long hike, another thousand mile plus hike. Uh, the Appalachian Trail has always been there and kind of pulling at me. So I may do that in the future. I can imagine it does get into your bones after a while or into your blood. This idea of these, I mean, uh, kind of uh, extreme challenges, um, you know, maybe not extreme in terms of really hard terrain, although maybe, but in terms of just the persistence, but getting into that meditative state. Uh, I, I can imagine that, that would be kind of addictive in a way. It is. And it's also very, uh, there's something about casting off a lot of cares and like responsibilities too. You're just out in the, in the wild, just you and whatever you can carry on your back. And you realize how little you need to actually survive and thrive. Um, so it's, it's kind of a, a reset button for me. It, 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 resets my priorities and resets my mind in a lot of very good ways. Yeah, I think that makes sense. There's something about, you're right, modern life is very busy, right? And sometimes yeah. good busy, sometimes busy just for the sake of busyness. Uh, right. And and so there is something about like strapping a moose head to your back and walking across <laughs> an island. <laughs> it's so much fun. <laughs> so was this able to get you away from a more traditional job during these two months or... Did you have the time off to be able to do it? Actually, at that time, I didn't have a full-time job. Uh, and I just did that in segments and kind of fit it into my life where it wherever it would fit. But whereas I can also be back with my family as much as possible. So mm -hmm. that's how I did the first one. Um, prior to that, I worked in cancer research full-time. Uh, but at the time I did the first hike, I wasn't working full-time. I was going to say, that sounds nice for even our job, Stuart. Just yeah. <laughs> take a month off and go hiking and, yeah. you know, meditate the entire time. Yeah, just yeah. just live tweet at Hope and we'll count it as work. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, well, Laureen Neuenheis, I, I admire so much what you've done because I think that 
it's well, I mean, it's I'll be honest, it's weird to just up and hike around a lake, but but it's really great to take, uh, you know, take the time and say, I'm going to do this right. I'm going to challenge myself. I'm going to mm-hmm. hit the pause button on the busyness of life. And I'm going to learn about me and learn about this resource. I, I just am in awe of you, you doing it. And uh, we really appreciate you being on uh, Teach Me About the Great Lakes. Is there a place where people can go to find more information uh, about you or about uh, your work um, or to follow you on social media or something like that? Sure, they can find all of that at Lake Trek. Dot com, as you mentioned before, Lake Trek as in Star Trek, which is a very good way of, <laughs> of <laughs> conveying that. Uh, they can find out about my books, my audio books, uh, my speaking engagements upcoming. Hopefully some of them by, uh, hopefully some of those speaking engagements will be near uh, the people and they can actually come out and hear me speak about the Great Lakes. Well, uh, Lorene, thank you very much for appearing on the show. And um, we look forward to following you on your next adventure. My pleasure. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you, Hope. Thanks, Irene. What a fascinating woman and what a fascinating experience, I think, uh, to, to do all of these sort of crazy extreme challenges, even split out over multiple days. I mean, the persistence there, uh, I have not seen that persistence outside of my kids asking if they can eat <laughs> before we we've yet? carried our plate out to do. Yeah, yeah. That was amazing to hear about. Yeah. So, uh, hope, what did you learn about the uh, great lakes today? Um, today I learned about the great lakes that if you were to walk around Lake Michigan, it would take about two months. Is that correct? Yeah, about 64 days, I think she said. Yeah, exactly. And um, I already own a pair of Keens, so I learned that I made the right choice when (laughs) hiking boot shopping. (laughs) Finding the right footwear is the first step to walking around the Great Lakes. (laughs) What did you learn? I learned two things. One, uh, that you can hike around Isle Royale with a moose head for science. (laughs) And I learned, too, that there's, there's... kind of an attraction, maybe even a value to approaching the lakes on this micro scale and to the calm meditative break from the busyness in which you reconnect to this fascinating resource. And I learned that although I will never, ever, ever, ever walk (laughs) 1,000 miles around the Great Lakes or across the Great Lakes, I really wish I were the type of person who did. All right, Hope. Well, this is it for another episode of Teach Me About the Great Lakes, episode number three. We encourage you to visit our website at teachgreatlakes.transistor.fm. We encourage you to like and to subscribe and to review and do all of those fun things. And if you have any questions or comments, go ahead and uh, hit us up on Twitter at Teach Great Lakes. Hope, where can people follow you on Twitter? You can follow Illinois Indiana Sea Grant at I L I N C Grant um, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And if you really want to follow me personally, you can find me at Hope Kira, H O P E K Y R A. Thanks so much, Hope. Thanks to our guest, Lorene Neuenheis, and we will talk to you next month. Bye, guys. Now we put in the beatboxing. You can just <laughs> add in the music from earlier. <laughs> <laughs> right. Bail effect doing sleigh ride. <laughs>